Oh, it's behind the bastards. Podcast. I hated that so much. <laughs> Why? Why'd you hate it, Sophie? <laughs> it was it really a jealousy. Woke me up. Say what you will. It woke me the fuck up. Some of us, Sophie, are broadcasting professionals like G. Gordon Liddy and thus have mastered the art of using our voice like an instrument. You know, I'm like uh, like Rachmaninoff. Right. But with with my instead of whatever Rachmaninoff used, because I don't actually know what that guy did. I have my voice and a microphone, you know, I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. You know what I'm going to dignify with the response? <laughs> Andrew T. What up? Ooh, 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 ooh. Andrew. What's up? Strikes still going on. Um, although I guess it's theoretically possible it's over by the time these episodes There's a drop. <laughs> tiny chance it has not. But I, if if I'm a betting man, and I very much am, all of my money is going on. Strikes still going on. Hey, everybody. Robert here. Obviously, since we recorded this episode, the strike has ended uh, more or less as of about like a week after we recorded this. So Andrew has sent me all of his money. Uh, He is now destitute and living in utter desperation. Um, He does have a GoFundMe, which you can donate to, but all of the money will go to me per the terms of this bet. Um, Never make a bet on a podcast, folks. Deeply serious stuff. If the strike is over by the time these episodes drop, we will just we will just unbleep this plug. Hey, everyone. Robert here. Uh, Since the strike is over and we can plug things again, go watch. Go watch the foundation on that Apple thing or torrent it. Torrent it. Ideally, you know, Apple's got enough money, but it's real good show. A lot of Lee Pace. Also, speaking of Lee Pace, watch Halt and Catch Fire. Equally good show. (laughs) <laughs> Which is the show I'm most looking forward to once TV comes back. So speaking of shows I'm looking forward to, to you know, Andrew, uh, the last time we had a strike like this, uh, a guy <laughs> named Donald Trump uh, sold a TV show, a reality yeah. show, because those are still allowed uh, and started his rise to power. And I'm yeah. kind of planning to do the same thing with my reality show Super soaker full of piss. <laughs> now, the premise of the show, for those of you who are new listeners, is that I fill the reservoir of a classic super soaker, an S, uh, a CS3200. Yeah, yeah. yeah. High capacity. Oh, that's the one with the backpack, if you remember the one like the rich kid would have. Oh, shit. Paper. <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's the big one. Um, and I fill that all the way up to the top. And I'm going to promise you all here right now, purely my urine, right? Not a drop of anyone else's. Mm-hmm. And then... Drive around Rodeo Drive. The the Robert uh, promise is at and not just bullshit. Not like you're gonna drink so much that the urine's gonna be at a concentration that it's not no. that bad. This uh, is primo. Yeah. Like you Absolutely. know, it's urine, urine. Absolutely, <laughs> nothing, nothing but Red Bull and Sapporo <laughs> beer. You know, the, the two <laughs> finest quantities that you can make piss out of. <laughs> so once I've loaded this sucker up, we're gonna go cruising on Rodeo Drive, looking for anyone who seems famous. That was the initial plan, but then mm-hmm. I came across a great article. Uh, about filmmakers who never won the Academy Award for Best Director, <laughs> Andrew. Orson Welles never got the Academy. Akira Kurosawa never got the uh, the Best Director Award. Hitchcock, Less surprising. Kubrick, Sergio Leone, you know, Spike Lee, Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, a lot of greats. And that made me think, if those guys can fail to get the Oscar for Best Director, maybe I can win it. So <laughs> now, Super Soaker Full of Piss, I'm planning on releasing as a film, you know, a major motion picture. Uh, The goal here is that I'm going to track down Martin Scorsese and just blast him right in the mouth with a super Mm -hmm. soaker full of urine. You know, I really Mm -hmm. think that's that's the key to to building myself a rep in Hollywood. (laughs) Yeah, the bad boys of documentary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Super soaker full of piss. (laughs) Answering answering the question we all have. What happens if you blast Martin Scorsese in the mouth with with lukewarm urine? You know, we'll learn. We'll pr- I promise you that. I promise you that he won't get away from us, folks. <laughs> and you're, you're not doing any aftermarket mods on this MF. No, no, just, no, no, no. This is a yeah, classic yeah. stock. No, cost me yeah. a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Andrew, when last we left off our hero, the G-Man, Gordon Liddy, <laughs> uh, he had... 
He had just started in a very serial killer like fashion, Whoa. murdering small animals in order oh to uh, in order to prepare for war so that he could kill men without thinking. This is almost honestly like it's worse to be like a serial. Obviously, to like torture animals as a serial killer. But there's something about what he's doing that's more unsettling. I, and I think it's partly yeah. that it, it proceeds more with it like a so someone who's like a serial killer. That's like, oh, there's some like something's wrong, right? Something's wrong with that person, you know, yeah. like that they that they because like people don't like most people have like a gut reaction to that. Yeah. With Liddy, what he is doing, this awful thing he's doing proceeds directly from a very socially reinforced impulse, right? The, the, the that like there's nothing better in our society. There's nothing more respected than being a soldier. Right. And that's yeah. that's like why he wants to do this. And so. I guess that's why I find it like so off putting. Obviously, it's off putting. He's like killing animals in a fucked up way. <laughs> it's like serial killer shit, but it doesn't seem like a compulsion. It just seems yeah. like he's like, I guess his version of masculinity required him yeah. to do this. And yeah. he is like analytically trying to turn himself into yeah, a serial killer because that will make him like he imagines you know the military heroes and his family's past and like that he's his mom is telling about he thinks it will turn him into one right i guess that's what's unset that's what's most surprisingly unsettling to me in this is that like this comes out of his belief that these men he reveres already have this capability right because he's weak and broken he has to kill dozens of chickens yeah. like in order to gain this capacity for himself that he thinks that like strong men are born with that's that's the thing that's off-putting maybe the, the other thing that's like upsetting is like it's you know like you know he doesn't but you almost feel like he could put it together that this is what's wrong with society like, right yeah, like, like yeah he, you know he almost could be like the fact that i feel the need to do this means there's something wrong with who i idolize yeah but no yeah <laughs> like he has all the pieces he has all the pieces of hey maybe i can break this cycle and yet he's like no i have to force myself to be part of the <laughs> yeah, cycle. For, like he's he's born a little more gentle than the generation before him and he he sees this as such a failing that yeah. he has to soak himself in blood to overcome it and do even more irrational things andrew let's get back into it yeah, so i'm ready speaking of things that scare g gordon liddy thunderstorms and electricity he develops kind of a phobia of electricity so in order to conquer this he climbs to the top of a power line tower and then crawls out on the arm so that he can grasp the wire far enough that his like hair oh will God. stands on its end in reaction to the current current okay do you know where he is he's like <laughs> if like Unbreakable was like a comedy yeah, just yeah. about the dumbest motherfucker who happens to be invincible yeah, and yeah. just like doesn't realize it and keeps on essentially committing yeah. suicide like over Yeah, there's and over so and over many again. little boys with the same thing going on who just got fried to a crisp atop a power tower. Um, this is actually not enough for him. He f feels like this is too tame. So when he gets home, he strips the insulation from a lamp's power cord and then plugs it in and holds it it electrocuting himself oh my God. <laughs> again this boy like seriously we're joking like this boy did need medical help right this is like yeah. a, a, a problem i don't know what you call this i'm not a diagnostician but this is a thing that someone needs like treatment for this is a serious issue <laughs> You know what? Now that I, because you're, you're, but like everything that is the antecedent of this, you're like, I see it so clearly yeah, from yeah, like uh, the war generation and like how this, sure. I'm just like, you know, maybe he is clearly an outlier now that right. we're seeing <laughs> yes. in many ways, he's clearly an outlier. And maybe we were really just saved by a full generation of, uh, you know, you know, numerous United States fascists yeah. simply because physics works. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the other guys, like, the, the the reason they didn't quite have the critical mass to take over completely is that most of them didn't survive going <laughs> yeah. through what Liddy did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Having fascism uh, brain, really, that's like Normandy, yeah. uh, like, landing in Normandy levels yeah, of survival yeah. odds. <laughs> 
<laughs> so when he was an adolescent, his dad coached his little league team one season, and and Gordon was so obsessed with impressing him that when he gets hit with the he gets hit with the face in the ball during a game, and he stops being able to see out of that eye for a while. But instead of like being like I have been injured, and like he 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 does he pretends nothing has happened, and he keeps playing. Now what's interesting to me is that in his autobiography, he does he he writes that he recognizes this later as like irrational and dangerous, right? Quote, with a convert zeal, I became contemptuous of anyone who didn't want to play hurt. Having found that fear can be defeated by head on attack, it never occurred to me that the reluctance of others to play hurt might be based on common sense rather than fear. <laughs> so there is a little bit of like, oh, you know what? That was actually kind of bad. I probably shouldn't he have like been doing that. The, yeah. Okay, here's, here's what I really want to know now. And I guess this is like almost findable, but not. Which is, what was the author's draft of this passage? I, I would love to know. I would love to know. Was this like, the, did the editor be like, Lydia, you got to stick something in here so people don't think like, yeah. <laughs> you're, 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 like, I don't I know. I want to see the know. first draft of this book now. I do. I do badly. want that. I want that from his papers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there is something like impressive. Uh, about the tenacity and mania with which he pursued his goals of what he called self-improvement. Uh, you will probably not be surprised to learn that G. Gordon Liddy was the weird kid at his school. <laughs> and like all weird kids, he had bullies. Uh, as an adult, he wrote that he accepted being bullied as a natural and normal thing, quote, so long as it didn't get out of hand. Now... <laughs> I don't believe he's telling the truth here because of what he writes next. I believe that being bullied bothered him more than he would ever admit, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a, a lot of people like it's bad to get bullied. It's a thing yeah. that can stick with you for a long time, but he could not because he's this, like he becomes this right wing media figure. He can't admit that like, yeah, I got bullied as a kid and like fuck me up. You know, he can't say that, right? Because they 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 have to be like, no, it's good for kids to get smacked around a little bit by the other kids, you know, makes them stronger, right? They need that. Yeah, yeah. So he has to, because he's cooked up this persona with himself, he's got to, he has to include in his book that he's fine with being victimized to what he calls a reasonable <laughs> level. But the story he tells next makes it clear, like the story he tells next is not the story of a kid who was fine with being a reasonable amount of bullied. And like, it is the story of a kid who is like pathologically victimized and snaps. <laughs> So the thing that provokes him into violent revenge, which is the story we're about to tell, is not targeted bullying, which I find interesting. It is, he describes this as like, at, at my school, there's like a hazing tradition, right? When it's a boy's birthday, another group of boys will like surround him and punch him, each one of them will like punch him in the bicep, right? For each year of his age, right? So he get like punched a bunch in the arm, right? And you get punched a bunch like that, you know, it hurts after a while, quite badly. They call these punches like bunnies. Each is delivered with a protruding knuckle under the bicep of the boy oh. receiving it. Oh, this is yeah. a Filipino martial arts, some limb yeah. destructions. It's I like love fucked it. up. Yeah, it's like, it, this is like, and it, I, I don't know, it's a little fucked up. It's like a pretty, I, I, I've heard of stuff like this. You know, when I was in, played football in, in fucking uh, middle school, we had like some hazing stuff. That's not wildly different from this. Um, definitely an unpleasant thing to go through. I think yeah. he was really scared of this, uh, but he describes it as like a serious danger. It was painful and paralyzing, making retaliation impossible. And since he's short, he decides that like, I can't defend myself from this, but it's unacceptable. So I have to turn my body into a trap. Quote, I was approached in the locker room. I, I removed my suit coat and feigned unawareness until they grabbed my arms. Then I ripped my arms upward and away. My would-be tormentors screamed as the flesh of their palms and fingers was lacerated. That morning, I had taken lengths of adhesive tape and pressed thumb and carpet tacks alternatingly into the sticky side so that the sharp points stuck out the dry side. The carpet tacks were longer and especially nasty, but they had narrower heads. The thumb tacks, with their broad heads, added stability under lateral stress. That done, I wrapped the tape around my arms carefully so I looked like a porcupine with short, very sharp quills. I wore an old white shirt I could throw away, and I packed a replacement in my school bag. The device worked well, though there was less blood than I had anticipated. Come on, I shouted after them. Try it again! Shocked and in pain, they would have none of it, backing away from me with incredulous stares. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, now like... He's like a cartoon hedgehog. Yeah, like, he is. He is. That is like about? cartoon. And it's it's also like 
I'm not going to say it's okay. like bullying's obviously bad. What he has described here is like hazing and not like extreme sounding hazing, right? I yeah. do think it is a little bit wild to go with like, yeah, you know, we have this hazing thing where on your birthday you get punched in the arm, you know, once for every year. He's like, okay, not the worst thing in the world. I am going to respond to that by taping put pins to, by yeah. turning myself into a hedgehog. <laughs> it really, uh, I mean, I guess it's also like the like trap of it. Yeah, it's so you know, unsettling. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the amount of like labor and mm-hmm. forethought. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just like if he was a different guy, you could view this as kind of cool, especially if and maybe that maybe this is a cooler story, right? Maybe he did get bullied a lot as a kid and this was like an act of justified revenge. But he doesn't tell us that, right? The way he describes this is like I was not really bullied. This was a thing that every kid went through and I responded like a maniac. (laughs) Again, he may be leaving out quite a lot here. We just don't know because I haven't run into other sources from his fucking junior (laughs) high school or whatever. So I realized realize we're like 10 pages into G. Gordon Liddy and not out of his childhood, which has never happened with a subject before. I don't think we've ever spent this much time on a subject's childhood, but like (laughs) there is so much shit in this autobiography. We are going to leave quite a lot out. So I'm going to try and summarize here some of the last few important facts. So one of the things G. Gordon admits in this is that when he was an adult, his dad, Sylvester, came to him and was like, my dad never hugged me. Right. Which is why Sylvester made a serious effort to hug Gordon regularly. This is kind of beautiful, actually, you know, like a guy recognizing, especially a guy who was born in the 1800s. Right. Probably uh, recognizing like, oh, it was bad that my dad didn't yeah. hug me, you know? Well, it seems like this family is introspective. Right. And, like, weirdly self-aware. It's this just is what a they do thinking with it. man's yeah. reaction to, like, thinking about his own childhood and, like, oh, you know what? I wish my dad had hugged me. That's a thing I'm missing. I am going to make an effort to hug my son regularly, right? Yeah. Gordon's reaction to it is kind of peculiar. Quote, it always seemed to me that that was just what he was doing, trying to hug me, wanting to, but not knowing how, (laughs) as if having never been the object of a fatherly embrace himself, he could not pass on what he had never received. In fairness to my father, I stress that this was a subjective impression. The fact of the matter is that he did hug me often, and it may well have been that my self-loathing, born of contempt for my weakness in the face of fear, rendered me unable to recognize genuine fatherly affection and to receive it when authored. Oh... And that's one of the things that that makes this guy interesting and kind of unique because I I can't imagine any of our modern like right wing media guys admitting to that kind of vulnerability being yeah. like I don't know if my dad didn't know how to hug me because he'd never been hugged or if I was unable to accept his love because I hated myself so deeply. Right. That's 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 actually a pretty powerful like th- r- yeah. thing to grapple with like for a human being that's like yeah. like it, it makes you emotional reading it where you're like well that's some real shit g gordon liddy you're yeah. you're a dangerous maniac but that is that is a real thing that you've expressed well but because it is it's like all yeah. the pieces are there all mm-hmm. the pieces yeah. for him to be like normal are there or like good are there but yeah it's just like what happened man mm-hmm. yeah it is he is like, from a diagnostic standpoint, fascinating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the last critical moment in his journey to conquering fear and pain w- is what he describes as, like, a p- potentially divine migraine attack. He claims that, like, he's scared of God, he's scared of pain, and then one day he's walking around and he suddenly is just overwhelmed by agony. The way he describes it, it sounds like a migraine, right? And being the Catholic boy that he is at this period, he decides, like, I will offer up my suffering to souls in purgatory, right? Like, since I'm already overwhelmed with suffering, I'll offer to take on their suffering if they need a break, (laughs) right? And hopefully they will put in a solid for me to God. (laughs) Oh my God. And he thinks this works because the pain is followed by rapturous pleasure and he like passes out, waking up later with no discomfort. He claims, from that day forward, I feared nothing but God and there would come even a day when I did not fear God either. 
Oh boy. <laughs> there's there has to be a medical explanation for what this is, right? What the fuck have, is he I have describing? No idea. I mean, like, like there's stuff migrate like migrate into rapturous pleasure to no longer fearing God. I, I, I don't know. Like my best guess is migraine, just because I don't know what else it would be. There's something called exploding yeah. head syndrome. I do think that normally, number one, it doesn't quite sound like what that is. And I think that normally occurs like kind of when you're on the edge of sleep, but I don't know. It's it's weird. I don't know what it would be. Yeah, but <laughs> G. Gordon Liddy, you know who uh, yeah. never <laughs> experiences <laughs> that is our sources. Oh, uh, yeah. And oh, yes, yeah, we're back. How you doing? Sorry. Yeah. That was just that was so wild. What a yeah. what a way to go out to commercial break. Holy shit. What a beautiful way to go out to commercial break. Yeah. So we're we're talking G. Gordon, the Lidster. As he grew into young adulthood, G. Gordon Liddy became increasingly aware of a flaw in his otherwise perfect mental health. <laughs> <laughs> he had an anger management problem. Now, he first noticed this while he was out. His, his, his uncle Ray, when he's a teen, buys him his first real gun. Terrible mistake. Oh, my God. So he goes out hunting with this gun. And while he's out in the woods, someone shoots over his head, right? Now, he describes this as close incoming fire. I am... Pretty sure he is exaggerating because that's the kind of guy that he is. And this is the closest <laughs> he ever gets to combat. Um, that said, you know, I can say a lot of the hunters that I know, especially out in the West, right? This is maybe less common. Uh, but like I, I, a lot of hunters I know have either had shots come near them or had people shoot over their heads. Sometimes it's a thing when you're really out in the boonies, you like wind up in somebody's spot and they may do it to try to scare you off. Also had family and stuff get like shot up again, shots over their head in like Oklahoma when they cross into like a pot farm or something, right? Stuff like this happens out in the back country. So maybe this is a true story. Maybe someone was actually shooting at him. Maybe it was some kid who was just firing. But he he responds by randomly firing five rounds just in <laughs> where he thinks the direction of the shot is. And it horrifies him, right? Uh, because he believe he like again, it's bad. You shouldn't shoot blindly in a direction, like because you don't know who you'll hit, right? So he 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 like this is what concern. He he becomes like frightened that like he has an anger problem and that like it might lead him to doing something terrible someday, and he doesn't want to do anything crazy, you know. Oh um, so he has like, and he he admits to being horrified by this. That's a it's if you react in that way, it's a bad way to react. Uh, it's reasonable to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. I should really work on myself. I should think <laughs> about like what led me to reacting that way because I, I can't risk doing this again. So reasonable <laughs> for him to feel this way. He follows that realization with this unhinged line. It was no good wishing I had more German and fewer Italian genes. I nope. know perfectly well that with a powerful <laughs> enough will, I could be as ice cult as any Teuton. <laughs> now... <laughs> <laughs> always, always with the Nazis that cannot help himself. Oh, my now, God. The word ice count. So I see that word in there and I'm like, I wonder, wonder if that's some Nazi shit. Right <laughs> now, it's just a word. It means ice cold in German, although it's often a, 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 um, uh, a colloquial term for cold blooded. Right. It literally means like something's ice cold. But like you would describe a cold blooded person as ice cult. It is, though pretty Nazi thing to say because I just typed the, I just typed Ice Cult and Hitler in and boy howdy immediately speeches start popping up right uh, probably the most famous use of this term by Hitler was his 1939 address to the Reichstag on the anniversary of coming to power quote as regards National Socialist Germany it is painfully aware of the destiny awaiting it should fascist Italy be wrestled to the ground by an international agglomeration of forces irrespective of pretenses we know these consequences and we shall cold-bloodedly look them straight in the eye. Hitler loved to use this term, and he used the phrase like cold-blooded. He liked to describe, you know, the ideal young German man as cold-blooded, as, as a hard as steel, as unfeeling, right? Because those are the people who commit genocide best, you know? Yeah. So Liddy, Liddy wound up getting some backblast from that shit. 
Oh my God. He grads, graduates, high, uh, graduates high school, World War II, the big dub dub dose is over by this point. So tragically, he does not get to go fight. Um, he does note a preference to having been able to fight the Japanese. Uh, but, <laughs> so he gets admitted to Fordham University, which is a very pretty college in New York that was initially at least, I don't know if it still is, but it was run by the Jesuits at this point, right? Now, the Jesuits are like an order within the Catholic Church that is like, you know, they're like the 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 smart guys. They do a lot yeah. of the teaching. They do a lot of the school running and shit. Uh, there was, you know, they've had a long history, some of which, you know, they had to be kind of like a secret society type deal. He finds the Jesuits admirable for their intellectual rigor and quality as educators, which is fine. He also finds them admirable because they remind him of the SS. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he describes them as <laughs> the shock troops of the Catholic Church. <laughs> um, notes that they were suppressed by the Nazis, but also writes... Heinrich Himmler used it as the model for his own corps of Ubermenschen, the Schutzstaffel, the dread blacked uniformed SS whose handpicked members swore a special oath of loyalty to the Fuhrer, which is like, that's not wrong, but like, that's an ins, that's like, why would you bring that up here? That's not relevant. Like, like we don't, yeah. we don't need a rant about how cool the SS are when you're talking about your college. Unnecessary, G. Gordon Liddy. This will be, this will be a continuing pattern. He cannot bring up the SS enough, like constantly. He he cannot stop specifically. It's not just that he brings them up. It's that whenever he becomes a it, it, like a member or associated with a new organization, he compares them positively to the SS. Like so. G. Gordon had missed the big dub dub dose, but by the time he got into college, the Korean War had started up. Which is so yay! Huzzah! <laughs> There's a war, and they're not Germans. I get to yeah, kill. A yeah, lot, a lot yeah. better for him. Yeah, really lines up great. Yeah. Now I brought this up on the show before, but my grandpa was in that war. He was there basically the entire time uh, it was happening, and did not seem to enjoy it. A uh, horrible yeah. experience, <laughs> terrible time. <laughs> yeah, and basically anyone who went through the Korean War will tell you fucking nightmare. <laughs> like you don't want it you don't want to be in that war. You don't want to be in most wars. Yeah, right. Liddy is desperate to see combat though. So he joins the ROTC at Fordham, which unfortunately I mean, he wants to be in the infantry or he wants to be Marine or something. He wants to do something that'll let him kill people. Um, but at Fordham, their ROTC is an anti-aircraft artillery unit. So he doesn't like that because you don't get to actually like, <laughs> generally you don't get to kill people close up with fucking anti-aircraft <laughs> artillery because it's kind of the point. So he he decides to do this because it'll at least like set him up to be an officer and his intent is that I'll, I'll transfer to infantry or armor later and then I'll get to go have my searing wartime experience that makes me into a man. So... <laughs> When it came time for his formal training and service, Liddy had fallen for a young woman who met most of his weirdo requirements for a wife, but lacked. Oh, right. <laughs> He's like, she's almost perfect, but she lacks mathematical ability, right? Oh. So he decides he wants his kids to be good at math. So he decides not to ask her for her hand in marriage because she's bad at math and she's too short. He writes that he wanted, quote, height and heavy bone structure so that my children would be physically as well as intellectually powerful. Oh, my God. Again, Unhinged. he could have just become Robert Crumb. Yeah, yeah. Like, he just, it's its the tragedy for us and then him <sighs> in that order mm -hmm. is he's just going to take it better paths. So many times. So many. Nearly anything he would have done would have been better than becoming G. <laughs> Gordon Liddy, right? Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, if he if he had just become a card shark, it would have been a better person. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, he parts from this mystery woman in the hope that he will find someone he describes as a, quote, tall, fair, powerfully built Teuton whose mind worked like the latest scientific wonder, the electronic computer. I had worked long, hard, pain-filled <laughs> years to transform myself to make a reality of my genetic potential. Now I believed I had earned the right to seek my mate from among the finest genetic material available. Yeah. He really was just God's perfect fascist. Oh like, my God. The, the good Lord really made a, a brilliant Nazi uh, yeah. with him. Yeah. Yeah. And the answer to all that is like, if you heard him say any of this out loud, you'd be like, yeah. 
yeah, man. And then just like kind of quietly take your beer to the other side of the yeah. bar. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good, Gordon. <laughs> and then, and then just walk away. Either that Damn, or call. I gotta go, man. Look, normally I wouldn't say this, but like I don't believe we should have sex police. But in this case, it would have been nice if like G. Gordon Liddy says this to you at a bar and you have someone you can call to be like, we got to make sure this guy doesn't like hook up with anyone ever. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't, don't let this man have love. Yeah, He's, he is not allowed. Yeah, he like actively should not have. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That sh- that should have been a social a priority for all of us. I don't know. Mm. One of his kids goes on to help stop Trump from stealing the election. So, yeah, that's probably why but, you shouldn't have sex police. But that's like that's like the two sides. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, but, you know, just because one of his sons sort of became one of the end dominoes doesn't mean he doesn't anti watergate one of the first yeah, yeah dominoes. by my mathematic count he there's still like 80 percent of a watergate that the liddy descendants need to stop so yeah <laughs> like, um anyway he goes to fort bliss to train with a bunch of other second lieutenants as artillery forward observers now an artillery forward observer your job is to be much closer artillery obviously is pretty far back from the front line. You know, that's why it, what it's for the uh, forward observer. Your job is to be much closer to the fighting so that you can spot and call in targets and stuff um, to, to the people shooting the big guns. This is obviously a dangerous job. Very important job. If you're doing a war, uh, Liddy though, he has to, again, he had, because this is what he almost does. He has to like breathlessly hype up the job and the danger. So he tells us that like life expectancy for the men who do this job is just three minutes which like, no, Gordon, <laughs> there, there is not any job. Now, in certain specific battles, right, you might be able to say like, you know, the life expectancy of a guy doing this one job in this very specific battle was this long because most of them died, right? If that happens, you could, I guess, say that. But that yeah. is not a thing that you can say of this job in general. It yeah. is fucking, there are people who do this for fucking years, right? <laughs> but these kind of claims happen a lot. You'll hear the claims about like the same job in Vietnam that has like a 20 minute life expectancy. No, that's not, it's not actually how, how war works. Yeah. How that, <laughs> like, well, it's also like, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I guess, like yeah, I guess a, a guy could die real quick. Yeah, yeah, but sure, like, it happens. But like, no, not yeah. generally. Like, absolutely yeah, well, that's not. Also just Gordon. like not a <laughs> job. Like if if it's you know, just too confusing. <laughs> if they die, if they just if you're every three minutes, you're just throwing yeah. another new yeah. college graduate into the meat grinder for this. All you do. Basically, so that your three minutes as you get there, you pick up yeah. the notebook from the last guy, <laughs> guy, hand it to the next guy, and immediately die. Mm-hmm. And again, there's like some specific battles where you can say like the average life expectancy for a, a man, you know, manning a flamethrower or whatever in this specific engagement along like this yeah. two mile ch- was this long, right? Because most of the guys doing this job died. That, that kind of shit has happened in war. That's not yep. what he's talking about. He's yeah, just yeah, full yeah. of shit. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> being full of shit will be a pattern for him. Here. Right. Uh, again, he does not do anything at all interesting in the military. He has a very boring time in service. So so he has to toss in anecdotes like this and other stories of almost <laughs> seeing danger so that he could because he can't like just be like, oh, yeah, I didn't get to do anything cool. Right. He has to like lie and, and make it make shit up. And so you get some very funny stories because it's always super sad. Like it is depressing <laughs> the degree to which this guy wants to have been, I don't know, my grandpa. Right. <laughs> like, right. Um, so near the end of his training, he and some comrades are drinking and they decide this is his claim. They decide to have a sit up contest. Right. <laughs> Liddy insists that he wins, but he wakes up in horrible pain the next day <laughs> and it becomes clear that he has blown up his appendix doing sit ups. <laughs> <laughs> and it's maybe there's a good chance he's lying about this. Although if anyone could do like if anyone could robotically do sit ups in a friendly competition <laughs> so much that they nearly kill themselves, it would be G. Gordon Liddy. <laughs> right, right, right. He has the mental capacity yeah. to fucking yeah. blow his own body up. Yeah. I, the way he describes this, everyone's very impressed by how good he is. And the next day he wakes up in pain. I kind of suspect like you know, some other guys are drinking and like Liddy comes in and he like walks up to them and like, like, oh, hey, Gordon, how you, how you doing, man? And he's like, I'm so pumped Why up. Can't wait to go die in Korea. And they're like, 
Yeah, man. You want to do like a sit-up contest? You know, can't talk during a sit-up contest. Why don't you see? We all just did them. Here's our numbers. Yeah. Why don't you, you see how first. many you can do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. You, I guess you win, man. Well, I uh, guess we got to go. Yeah. Oh, time. To, yeah, we got to bounce. Hope your appendix is fine. <laughs> So he because he's blown his appendix out doing sit-ups, he gets told his like superiors are like, well, yeah, you know, we have to go do surgery on you now. So you can't finish your training. He was about to do, you know, this this like last bit of training that would have like cleared him for a coveted close combat assignment, right? And so he is <laughs> furious, right? He's about to miss. This was his his shot to be a badass, and he's gonna miss it. So <laughs> After he has his surgery, like his his colleagues are doing their their last course, which is like a nighttime close combat infiltration course. So Liddy <laughs> describes while he's still got this open surgical wound, <laughs> he straps a bunch of belts around it to protect it, oh throws on God. his shirt, and then sneaks into the uh, the course in order to finish it, which is like crawling around in the mud and doing stuff you shouldn't do right after t- oh, <laughs> abdominal this surgery. Is, this reminds me a lot like of uh Stephen Miller like trying to race yeah. against the girls when he was at Santa Monica <laughs> High or whatever. <laughs> he was like, Yeah, oh, I'm yeah, men are superior to women, and thus so I'm going to funny. enter into the fucking like women's 400 meter or whatever the fuck he did. Yeah, god, that's oh. funny. God, that's funny. <laughs> so his CEO's he like is like, Look, guys, I did the you know, I finished it. You know, can I have my like certificate for finishing it? And his commanding officers are like dude, you're not supposed to be here. Like, we told you (laughs) not to do this because you just had surgery. Like, absolutely not. You are not getting, like, a certificate for this. And, like, this is also why he doesn't go to Korea because if you're the kind of people whose job it is to, like, send people over to do a combat position and you're responsible in any way, shape, or form and you see this guy as, like, oh, this dude endangers himself constantly and is incapable of following orders and is like nearly got, gotten himself killed at home in training because he's so irresponsible. <laughs> Absolutely, we are not putting this man in a combat situation. Like, oh. this is the last guy you want next to you in a trench. He's a fucking maniac. Yeah. So Liddy gets back to New York and he serves in an urban anti-aircraft unit stationed in the city. Now, because as you might guess being in an anti-aircraft unit in new york city is is a do-nothing job for fuckers right this is like not the job you give a guy who's like a great warrior yeah right um yeah because like I, again like the idea is that oh if the soviets you know attack we'll need yeah. anti-aircraft but the reason why those guns are there is primarily so that civilians feel protected because at the even at this point everyone knows like well yeah if we have a war with the soviets it's just the end of the world right we all just die <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah these guns are not gonna help <laughs> yeah, these are not gonna be a real factor in that conflict <laughs> so Liddy spent the rest of his life ashamed of this uh, and in his autobiography he invents several very sad moments where he has to threaten people with a gun in order to feel like a big man oh, and I, I don't know if I need to say this but I will because it's crucial all of the men that he invents to threaten with a gun at this point in the book are black men sure yeah like uh, uh, soldiers you know yeah but yes that is uh, worth that's uh, one, worth bringing one of, up about Liddy. one of the least surprising things <laughs> yeah. about this so far yeah perhaps not shocking yeah yeah so the 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 gist of the story is that in 1954 one of these integrated aa units which is like by integrated i mean there were black and white men serving together right which is starting to happen in this period of time not Kind of, I don't think comp- comprehensively it's starting to happen, though. Um, one of these newly integrated units, the black enlisted soldiers mutiny against their white officers. Liddy and another white officer, a captain, are sent in to take over. Um, and he he's going to tell a story from this that is quite problematic. But you know what's not problematic, Andrew? <laughs> Hit me. Mm. Ads. Ads <laughs> would never make up stories about... <laughs> threatening your fellow soldiers with guns so that people don't think you're less of a man for failing to serve in Korea. (laughs) Oh my God. Oh God. Anyway, back to the story. So here's Liddy 
telling the tale of uh, he and this other officer, you know, going in to take over this this unit with primarily black enlisted men. I told the troops that military courtesy and discipline would be enforced impartially and that certain practices that we understood had been tolerated in the past would not be permitted in the future. Specifically, I said that we had heard that certain individuals had brought liquor on the post and others had failed to show up for morning roll call formation when the weather was cold or wet. There would, I said, be no privileged characters in the battery. Finally, I tapped the leather holster under my left shoulder. It held a personally owned caliber 38 special Smith & Wesson revolver. I stared at the assembled men and told them that the first man to raise a bayonet against me would be shot on the spot. (laughs) Now, there's a pretty good chance this is a lie. Some officers and NCOs in combat units did, and I think maybe still do, get to carry their own sidearms. Now, I should also note, sidearms are basically not, are very, extremely rare for a handgun to be used in modern war, and even really in Korea, not all that common. Um... Because they're not good weapons, right? A, a handgun is a good weapon if you need if you're concealing it on your body and you're attacked out in the world. If you are in a battlefield, you would you would prefer a rifle, right? Like that's right. why they, that's why they exist. So they're not <laughs> not super common for this to happen, and certainly not back home. Right? For one thing, a lot of units in situations like this, when you are in a city, when you're like. You're, most of the soldiers are not going to be issued firearms with live ammunition all the time, yeah, right? Like you all. are, yeah, yeah, at all, right? You want to be careful about that, right? And in fact, he talks later about like one of his soldiers having a weapon that's unloaded because that's was the norm, right? So I don't know that I believe he would have been allowed to carry a loaded thirty-eight special to threaten men with. <laughs> like, um, maybe it's not impossible, but it does seem unlikely based on what I know about like the standards of the time um, and uh-huh. what was you know. Again, generally when like duty sidearms, when like officers were allowed to carry duty sidearms that were not issued to them, they were like higher ranking too than like a second lieutenant. This seems like something he would have gotten in trouble for, is what I'm saying. Another instance that Liddy relates during this time is this very large black soldier who gets arrested and has to be taken to a military jail. Now, uh, Liddy is ordered to put together a detail to, like, put this guy, you know, transfer him over to the the facility. But the guy's very big and the other soldiers are scared of him. And then at, at, like, one point when they're trying to take him over, he, like, picks up an axe and threatens them. So Liddy has to pull his gun to threaten this guy. (laughs) Like, you know, I'll put six bullets in the the space of a dime in your chest, you know, like that Uh. kind of fucking deal. Just so fucking sad. (laughs) Like, absolutely a lie and deeply sad. Yeah, it's all so pathetic. Yeah, based on again, I I grew up not just talking to my my and my grandpa. By the way, was a was a was a medic, right? Like that was his job. Like that was the thing he did. He kind of later in the war wound up just running field hospitals because everyone who had been an officer ahead of him, he was a, a sergeant when the war started, died. Like that was the <laughs> shit he did. But like, I read books because I wanted to understand what he'd done. I read books about like the unit that he was with, the Fifth RCT Regimental Combat Team, and stuff. And like, based on just kind of that general knowledge I have, some stuff I've looked up and conversations with veterans in the modern era. Here is how I would characterize Liddy's service: He was an unreliable and kind of dangerously irresponsible person who hurt himself pointlessly in training. His officers put him in a place where they thought he could not do any harm until his time in the military was up. Um, he he reports in his book that like he learned later that one of the officers had said he'd never get a combat posting, right? Which I don't doubt. And because he was so ashamed of this, he made up a bunch of stories about threatening men with firearms so that people reading this book in 1980 would think he'd been a badass. Yeah, that's really sad. <laughs> like oh. that is a profoundly sad experience. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like, so, you know what he is? He's basically like a, a Cobra Commander, just like yeah. real sniveling, like yeah. a real sniveling fashion, like a sniveling little like a worm, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little grub of a man. <laughs> oh God, it's so it's so bleak. Like this, this whole, this desire, this belief that like the only thing that makes you a man is like being in combat. And then the fact that he's, he's completely failed in that one ambition. And so he's just spent his life lying about being tough so that people would think he had, he experienced something close to what he, what he imagines as this like sacred baptism of fire. 
Yeah. Which it's it's not, right? There's certain things that being in that situation teaches you, certain ways in which, you know, people who experience that obviously can be hardened in some ways. It can make them tougher in some ways. It also often makes people less capable of dealing with the world, yeah. less capable of surviving, yeah. right? Like, that is why there's so many suicides from guys. Like, uh, although a lot of suicides, uh, anyway, but complicated yeah, issue. Yeah. But he's he, is, he has mythologized this so far past the point of rationality that it is basically a religion to him, right? Like, combat is heaven to G. Gordon Liddy. And he's... He's permanently locked out of heaven, right? Yeah. He's just spent his entire life in limbo. <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's going to be really the driving impetus behind everything else he does, behind Watergate, too, behind the co- way he presents himself, the reason why you, you know, the, sh- the shit he would do, like st- sticking his hand over a candle until it burnt him to the fucking bone. Like, he did that kind of shit so that people would not, because he he was so deeply insecure about his failure to yeah. go to war, right? He's like he's like if Ben Shapiro actually had a form of courage, right? Right. There is that little bit of it, right, where he is yeah. willing to damage yeah, himself he's to, I mean, pointlessly. Yeah, he's yeah. he's like like mm-hmm. you know, for all his talk, Ben Shapiro isn't out there starting fights with people. Yeah, you know, and mm-hmm. you know. At least, at least G. Gordon Liddy has, yeah, the courage of putting his, like, body on the line. Yeah, the somewhat. courage of destroying his appendix in a sit-up yeah. contest. <laughs> so awesome. That Bursting his so guts hard. doing sit-ups. My God. Yeah. <laughs> so at age 23, he's in this nowhere career in the Army. He's got no idea what to do with himself. Uh, so he decides, you know, to try to figure out what's next for him. He's going to go and he's going to get his IQ tested right? He cl- <laughs> he's got to be one of these guys, right? He claims that he gets measured several times and it's always between 137 <laughs> to 142, which is a near genius in a lab. Now, we all know IQ's bullshit. Uh, that said, given his, he's, he's apparently a, a pretty competent lawyer for a while and given like what IQ measures, Maybe yeah. he did t- did test well, you know. I again, yeah, I don't yeah. particularly I probably, value that, but it's possible. Yeah, I I think it's pro- it's probably really likely he does well on an IQ yeah. test. He's got like he's got the kind of mind. Again, as a kid, he's able to like make gunpowder and shit. Like yeah. when he puts his mind to shit, I, I would not be surprised, especially if he studied for the IQ test. Well, more importantly, yeah, he's yeah. got guy who thinks IQ tests matter yeah. energy. Yeah. It's possible. Um, doesn't really matter. So, yes. um, but he does. It does matter that he wants us to know this, right? That yes, does yes, again. Yes. It's another another little piece of the Liddy puzzle. Now, he had always planned to be a military man, but at this point, it's become clear the military does not want that, <laughs> him. So he is lost, and he decides to take an aptitude test from the Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation's Human Engineering La- uh, Laboratory. Johnson O'Connor was the founder of modern aptitude tests, or at least a top (laughs) candidate for that. He's one of the guys who invents this as a thing. And the tests this company offers today cost like 600 bucks and they can last like three days. I haven't found much info suggesting they're actually good for anything. You get some people saying it was helpful. (laughs) You get I have I've run into a lot of modern complaints where they're like, yeah, I took the test and then they just they asked me what I wanted to be and then gave me like high school guidance counselor advice on the thing that I had told them I wanted to be, which I knew I wanted to be anyway. Like, Yeah. (laughs) I, I'm not gonna, I I don't know enough about this field to like, say this is definitely a con, but I, it does. Yeah. I I get that little like tingling on the back of my neck. Maybe it's because I'm not an aptitude test guy, but Liddy, if it is a con, if this was a con, Liddy was a willing mark because he's a gullible narcissist. And if he can take a (laughs) test that tells him he's amazing, he's going to, he's going to spend any amount of money. (laughs) Quote. After three days of testing, I was given an extensive report telling me uh, such things as that I was cross-dominated, left-eyed but (laughs) right-handed, possessed the vocabulary of a vice president of General Motors, and was very intelligent. (laughs) First off, that really says a lot about the difference in worlds, because if someone today was like, you know, I've got the vocabulary of a VP at General Motors, I'd go... The guys who make dog shit cars? I don't know, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> come back to me when you've got the vocab of a Toyota VP. But also any corporate vice president, like Yeah, right. Like it's like that's not impressive. They don't use words much, right? Yeah. They're like test makers. You're already lying. Just tell them yeah. they're an English professor. Who gives a shit? Yeah, who gives a shit? Like, why do we like 
is that a th was that a thing that like vice presidents of companies were seen as being like great vocabulary havers? Today they're the guys who are using Chat GPT to send their emails because they can't fucking yeah. write. Like anyway, whatever. <laughs> so he gets advised by this test to become a lawyer, uh, and so he he starts law school. He's still like I think he's in the reserves at this point, so he transfers to the the JAG Corps, and he meets a young woman during this period, Francis, who is the same height as him. Uh, and he finds this critical dimension even taller in heels because he definitely has a kink here. <laughs> Quote, far from being sensitive about it, I enjoyed having on my arm a woman six feet tall. When I learned that Fran's job at IBM was to receive from brainstorming electronic engineers short written descriptions of theoretically possible new kinds of computers for which she would then create a mathematical language and that she did calculus problems for recreation the way I did crossword puzzles, I knew she was the woman I wanted to bear my children. A Teuton slash Celt of high intelligence, a mathematical mind, physical size, strength and beauty. She had it all. <laughs> oh my god. What a moon man way of talking about that. Like, <laughs> oh god. It is, yeah, it really is like <sighs> But it's also like so close. You know what you're, you like. Uh, That's again, actually pretty admirable. Yeah, and he I wonder how you feel about this. So his 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 Again, so they're kind of long distance. He's still doing school. He's still in the military a little bit. So like there's this period of time where he's like really insecure that she's going to find someone else because he's not able to be around all the time. So he spends all of his savings on a voice recorder and he <laughs> sings a bunch of love songs into it. And then he leaves it with her, making her promise to listen to it regularly. Now, <sighs> we got a three person team here. Quorum, you know, uh, do we uh, is that sweet? Is that creepy? Where, where are we landing on that one? <laughs> Um, speaking because I find it unsettling. Here, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a no for me, dog. That's a, that's a no. That's a that's a big N W O, um, which is how I spell no. No woo. So, oh god, wild shit. No, thank you. Look, I, I, I think I think that is one of those things where, like, if we liked him, we would find a reason to be like, that's kind of sweet. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, again, it's but the kind also, of thing. no, we wouldn't. <laughs> no. It's not that kind of show. When you <laughs> add it to everything well, yeah. else, yes, I don't know. Yes, like yes. if he, if he, if if this was a podcast about people who went on to become great blues singers, and he was like, so I sent her a bunch of like songs that I'd recorded because I knew yeah. that would make her, you know, fall for me. That was my best. I'd be like, oh, okay, you know, that's kind of that's, yeah. that makes sense like, for the kind of guy just, you are. I'm just thinking yeah. of the that's scene not... <laughs> from the Barbie movie where all the Kens sing to Barbie and. And all the Barbies look like they want to run away. That's G. Gordon Liddy, baby. <laughs> he can make a Barbie run away. Although it works on this lady. So yeah. again, he clearly, so, so uh, he, he must have known his target, right? Yeah. They get married. They're married 54 years. Well, oh, sorry, Sometimes girl. there's not lessons. And uh, look, <laughs> we can make fun of this, but it does work apparently. For yeah. one guy, don't don't For, don't, they, don't don't do, do this. this. Oh, don't do yes, this. yes, yes, don't Christ. do this. I mean, today she'll be creeped out that you found like an old school voice recorder. Like, would you buy it? How much money did you spend on this I'm tape wake recorder? Up from after we do this episode and have DMs of people doing this. If mm -hmm. you do that, I will. I will uh, no ban. Yeah. ban immediately. We will, no, we will. We will launch airstrikes. We will send in B-52s. Robert, Robert threatens that a lot. Yeah, yeah. We have, we're part of the nuclear triad now here at Cool Zone Media. Like, we'll do it. I don't give a fuck. So, <clears throat> Liddy also promises that during this period, the military selected him to attend a clandestine activities training course, and he was instructed there in, quote, techniques of surreptitious entry. He goes through all, he's like, yeah, they brought me in to do the secret training. I don't know why, but it taught me how to like break into places and like be an expert on like spying on people. And I did all of this, but I was told not to mention I'd done it and they didn't issue a certificate of completion. So there's no record of me ever going to this class, but it definitely happened. And that's how I learned all of my great Watergate skills. <laughs> and it's, it's again, if like he was a famously, if he was a guy who'd like successfully done a bunch of like, you know, fuck job political shit and then gotten caught at the end after like this long career of like right. crazy escape. I'd be like, I, I don't know, maybe like Thanks. there's at least a need to explain how you learned all this. But like yeah, Watergate, yeah. as we'll talk about, 
you just were a dumbass. Like there was a complete cock up. Like at no point did you know what you were doing. You should never have been in that position because you were deeply, deeply, deeply unqualified to be managing something like this. I don't need this explanation as to how you learned this because you didn't. Yeah, you don't yeah. know anything. <laughs> like, I guess it's just like when you're shit. writing this book, it's just like, well, it's part of my brand. I'm the yeah. B&E guy. So. Yeah, I got to let people know the army gave me secret training that there's no after after learning I was a fuck up. They gave me secret break yeah. into buildings training. Yeah, <laughs> no, they did. not G. Gordon wasn't from comic books. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't from I, a Dick Tracy, a real good Dick, a real juicy Dick Tracy. Run. Yeah. I don't believe you at all. <laughs> so once his law school's done and Liddy's final obligations to the army are through, he applies for and joins the FBI, probably with some help from his uncle Ray, right? There's probably right. some nepotism going on here, right? I don't think he gets in on merit, right? Oh, so God. now this is the first part of the narrative where we have outside information about Liddy's life. So we are not as reliant upon like his fucking <laughs> autobiography here. So we are going to be weighing outside information as we go on pretty heavily against his questionable claims about his early professional life. Now, <laughs> Liddy's version of events is very exciting, right? He's stationed as a field Indi agent in Indiana and organized crime runs Indiana. And he, 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 he the two of the guys in his, in his field office are veteran gunfighters. They were wild Old West sheriffs who the FBI brought in and made exceptions for because they needed <laughs> gunfighting trainers. And these guys taught me how to be one of the best gunfighters in the world. <laughs> Again, G. Gordon Liddy, never in a gunfight. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god he's like a side character in justified he's yeah, just like a yeah. guy that like runs off a cliff into like <laughs> yeah, a, yeah. a cold open Shoots of a justified himself on accident doing a draw <laughs> <laughs> now he goes into one of the things that's funniest to me so there's a term if you're you know, regular listeners will know that I I, I uh, like shoot and am, you know, a, a firearms collector. If you are someone who does this, there's a term within the gun community called like FUD. And it's like from <laughs> Elmer FUD. And it's a term for like weirdos who buy old, obsolete firearms. In some cases, ones that are not safe, but often that are just like very bad guns to use to defend yourself. And then we'll spend hours on the internet insisting that like these are the best guns in the world. And they're they're <laughs> always maniacs. They're always G Gordon Liddy types, right? And always <laughs> fans of G Gordon Liddy, I should add. So he goes into these loving descriptions about how they like see his 38 that he threatened all of those soldiers with and are like, no, you got to get the most this. And he sh they showed me the most powerful gun on the planet, a 357 Magnum. And, you know, they let me carry theirs for a while until my wife bought me one for Christmas. And it was the best gun in the world, the most dangerous weapon ever recreated. And I was like, dude, calm down. <laughs> calm down first off one of the things that's funny about this is like not in like i think the 70s there's going to be a shooting the fbi is involved in that is a disaster a famous disaster and part of why is that like most of the fbi agents are all packing fucking revolvers which are very outdated in the fucking modern world in a gunfight so it's very funny to me that he's obsessed with these mighty revolvers and they're yeah you know, anyway he's very <laughs> weird weird dude Think once you to be impressed that these old sheriffs taught him how to gunfight. And again, <laughs> oh my God, no evidence right. he was good at any of this. Um, so by this point, he'd gotten married to a brilliant, tall computer programmer wife is <laughs> his, 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 his wife here. And in one passage from his book, he drops casually that before they get married, like they've been dating, they're kind of engaged. But once he gets hired to the FBI, he's like, well, you can't just marry someone once you're in the FBI. So he illegally uses the FBI's file system to check up on her background and her family members before proposing. He also does this for their neighbors before he buys a house. I don't think this is legal, although he says everyone at the FBI does it. And in fact, agents were expected to do this to avoid embarrassing the FBI by associating with disreputable people. I actually think he might be telling the truth about that because this is the yeah. J. Edgar Hoover FBI. And that's yeah, yeah. like that is the kind of shit they pull. So I will give him that. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say, yeah, I, I think this is like I, I've known a couple of people who have had access to perform background checks and they do it pretty casually <laughs> now we're gonna roll to a stop here because you've got to go to a uh 
uh, a baseball game. But I, I want to note that like it's in this part of the book where he's talking about <laughs> spying on his wife with the FBI's <laughs> file system to see if she's good enough to be an FBI man's bro like wife. And it's it's at this point that Liddy gives us yet another baffling reference to Hitler's SS. <laughs> Quote, as Adolf Hitler was referred to throughout the Third Reich as simply Der Führer, so J. Edgar Hoover was referred to throughout the FBI as the director. There were only a few of us, 6,000 out of 180 million, to stand between our country and those who would destroy it. I was truly convinced we were an elite corps, America's protective ech echelon, its Schutzstaffel. <laughs> Oh so my God. He, he's like, we were like America's SS, and it doesn't think for a second. Is that maybe bad, Gordon? Oh my is that like God. is that like maybe a problem with the FBI that like you're not wrong when you say uh, and I, I think you were not the only guy in the FBI who saw them as America's SS, but like yeah, is that maybe a problem, Gordon? <laughs> like and look, sh should we the, should we uh, interrogate this further? All <laughs> I will just point out is that people today who chastise mm -hmm. you because Republicans <laughs> used to be reasonable people mm -hmm. are talking about people that listened to all of this and thought, yeah. yes, the, this is the great. guy that again, the man writing this is the dude who came to Richard Milhouse Nixon with a plan to illegally spy on the Democratic Party. And Nixon was like, yeah, all right, let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah hold him in. <laughs> Get this guy in there. <laughs> it didn't quite go that way. We'll talk about that. But like basically, right? right? Like basically, yeah. um, I do love he cannot stop making SS references. And they're always positive. They're always like, we were <laughs> like the SS. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's very like hilariously Dr. Strangelove yeah. in a way that yeah. you're like, huh. <laughs> Guess this huh. guy's eternal. Guess this kind of dude always been around and maybe always will be. Shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, endless. Endless forever. Yeah. That is one of the like unsettling things is trying to be like, well, how did he become this way? Because again, and, and you know, we're missing a lot. He probably leaves out a lot. Maybe his parents were like fucked up in ways that we don't get in this. But that's but, like, the crazy thing is even the the part he put out is insane. Yeah. yeah. That's, well, it's, it's so, just like yeah. how? How does how what is what made you? I guess we know America made you, right? Yeah. Like all of this does make a degree of sense when you think about like this the this degree of fetishization of the armed forces, this idea that like <laughs> right. there's something religiously sacred about the experience of combat. It makes you a better man. You know, all of this kind of like oh. shit our our weird gun cult worship stuff, right? All yeah. of this is G Gore. So I, I don't know. I don't know why I'm saying I don't get this. He yeah, makes yeah. complete sense, right? I'm an idiot. He he's totally makes sense. Yeah. He makes sense, but it's still, you're just like, it can't be like this. Really? Can it? Yeah. And the answer is yes, but Jesus yes, Christ. Yes, yes, for sure. It can. I think part of why we're like, there is this like confusion is he is so honestly the man, even guys who do suck like Crowder and Ben Shapiro, they're pretending to be him. Right, right, right. You know, right. like when you see him smoking a cigar and you can tell they hate it, or like they hold a gun like somebody who's never fired a gun before. Right. It's like, oh, this is like you're putting on G. Gordon Liddy. What? He was yeah. like, li he was like lying and like making himself up into something, but like he was legitimately this kind of maniac, right? Yes. Like, I guess there's a degree right. of honesty. There's a kind of honesty in his lies, even. Yeah. Right? That, well, that it's, modern it's like ones difference. don't have. Like Ben Shapiro yeah. is like fake, like holding a bunch of two by fours from yeah. his truck and his truck bed that's yeah. never been used. G. Gordon Liddy's has been used. It's just been incompetently used. Yeah. To the yeah. point yeah. where right. the, the people around yeah. him were like, actually, mm -hmm. G, yeah. I got this. I'll, I'll handle it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. He's also full of shit about like being dangerous and being a hard man. Yeah. But, but he he's tries. full of shit in such a way that you know he spends his nights weeping over the fact that yeah. he didn't make it to Korea. And practicing. Right? Yeah, and, like, and really practicing. working at it. He spent, you know, that he did spend thousands of hours drawing that fucking cowboy gun, like yeah. to feel like a big man, you know, yeah. to feel like I could be, you know, if it just came, you know, if the right things happened, I could really be a fucking old west sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did it the hard way. Everything he right. did, you could tell he really worked. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, he worked at being a he didn't just buy the thing. He like worked at being a, a yeah. maniac. He so, was the thing. Good for you, G. Gordon Liddy. 
I great guess. for you and for I don't, us. Yeah, and for us. I don't know what else to say about you, so I'm going to let you go, Andrew T. You got anything to plug first? Oh, you know, podcast, yo, is this racist? Uh, we're still on strike almost certainly you never know i suppose and so uh yeah come come support us if you found this <laughs> my side of things enjoyable yeah so find that out check that out uh support the strike support super soaker full of piss by yes you know peeing in a super soaker and just mail it somewhere i don't know where i don't care where send oh send yeah send a piss loaded super soaker to a stranger yeah you know just just send it send it to the uh you know warner brothers corporate offices right and that's fine it is too. what it is yeah it is what it is <laughs> <laughs> probably not illegal on our part we'll uh we'll check in with that <laughs> asterisk yeah check your local laws uh-huh behind the bastards is a production of cool zone media for more from cool zone media visit our website coolzonemedia.com or Check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.